I wonder if we, um, if you want to, I mean, I'm game to uh, suspend this one if you wanted to after this meeting today to try to relieve the stress. It's actually not a bad breaking point since we're right at the end of the kind of the probability part and he's starting to get into the, on the other hand, he's starting to get into really interesting stuff, but it's stuff that we may already have covered in other places. I don't know, it's just a thought. I'm trying to look for the table of contents in this book. Yeah, I'm not sure because uh, at least for me, this this chapter was probably my my most favorite one. Yeah, I liked it too. <laughs> me too. Yeah, I, I actually learned a lot of stuff that even I, I got to know a, a couple of misconceptions that I had about, for example, the central limit theorem. So like if the next chapter happens to be as good or even better than this one, then I would like to to keep on, but if you want to, then yeah, we can terminate it. No, I'm just saying because you're picking up this other JavaScript thing, I didn't want you to be overloaded either. I'm actually in three right now because I'm in advanced R on Mondays. I'm in this one, and I'm also in regression other stories tomorrow. Um, so, uh, yeah, the next um, chapter I did read it already. It's actually does. It's pretty interesting to me because it's basically about regression, but it takes a very much more of a uh, um, rigorous, I guess you'd say, approach. And it's certainly the business about. Um, well, let's take, take a look. So the next chapter is regression. So it's going to be all about. You know, you know some of the stuff you're very familiar with, bias variance trade off, and all that, and that kind of thing. But it takes it takes more of a rigorous approach to it that I haven't necessarily done before. Uh, in fact, some of that chapter when I read it, I'm like, I'm probably gonna. This says you know skip this part. I'm like, I am gonna skip that part because that's like I don't want to get into that level of detail. Uh, the next chapter about estimation is actually something about maximum likely estimates and unbiased estimates and all that. Something I've always been curious about, but never really don't got any detail about. So that looks interesting. And then, comp then the next chapter is confidence intervals. Also interesting because that's something that I think a lot of people, myself included, I play fast and loose with, and he wants to, he has a very uh, detailed thing. So I'm, I'm, I'm game to keep continue, but if you do feel at some point that you get overloaded, just let me know. Um, let me know. Uh, we can... Yeah, actually uh, next, next week, I will be in a total of, five book clubs oh, I, am facilitating, I am facilitating two of them but I still uh, I, I want to finish this one I, I, I would feel bad if I, we were to leave it I know me. I know me too I would feel bad too but I just I'm just trying to I just happen to notice that you're doing that other one and I don't want to make you feel obligated if you don't if you want to but I'm I'm really really do like to finish this book so all right good that was that discussion out of the way let's press on we can keep going Next week, I'm doing uh, the regression chapter. So this week, you're doing, yeah, I agree with this chapter, the sample statistics chapter, which is really interesting, really good stuff. Uh, also, did you mean the, that you you'd like to skip the, the parts about the proofs? Uh, no, not all the, no, I didn't. There was one section in the, uh, I thought it was it now, I'm trying to remember now. At least in, in the next chapter on regression, there's a discussion that he does about um, overdetermined and underdetermined systems, which I think is actually not well done. <laughs> and it, and so I was going to, I'm planning on skipping that part, for example. I think that was the only real thing I was imagining, I was thinking I was going to skip over. But I'm, you know, when, I, when we go over the book, I mean. But, um. Yeah, I mean, in the statistics part, I haven't really found issues with the book, but, but I think that's mainly due to my own ignorance. But in the mathematics part, uh, sometimes I do get a little infuriated uh, yeah. because of the author. So maybe that, that happens for you as well in some yeah. statistic concepts. Yeah, it does happen. Okay, so for, for this chapter, well, I don't have yep. the notes in book done. I simply summarized in the book oh that's another thing i wanted to bring up too that might help us out is that rather than making these you know book down things and spending we don't need to it's just you and me there's no need for us to like unless you want to 
like because you want to practice your you know LaTeX and, and book down skills but I'm happy to do it this way you know where you just use the book and we can just talk through the chapter in that way you know what I'm saying that'll help make it easier with especially with multiple book clubs going on do you concur yeah obviously yeah, you concur yes, that's I, reason. Yeah, I would like for us to uh, be doing it this way yeah Not okay simple. great I 100% on board with that <laughs> okay Okay, so let's start. And okay. uh, this will be the sixth chapter of the probability for data science book. We will be covering sample statistics. Uh, some of the goals for this chapter is mainly uh, to summarize uh, what the author describes as microstates. And he refers to all of the data that you have. Um, from such data, uh, as I said, summarized or get some statistics that represent the whole data, things like the mean value or the variance. Uh, we will be doing that uh, due to a problem that we experienced in the last chapter, where sometimes your, your joint distribution depends on too many variables. And uh, when the, the dimensionality is too big, sometimes you just gotta summarize it and, and try to get some something to work on with the data. Uh, so as I mentioned, instead of reporting the states of each individual, that is each of each observation, uh, we are going to be reporting sample average or sample statistics. Uh, let's see. Well, the next section is called the significance of sample average. Uh, Oliver he, he mentions uh, that uh, in a real scenario you're working with a lot of data, so you have many variables, which gives rise to a Joint distribution with high dimensionality. Um, because of such high dimension, it can be kind of tough or difficult to, to work with such function, with such PDF. So instead of that, we'll be looking at an average of the observation register, in this case, um, a mean of the random variables. And such mean will be called the sample average. And there will be, um, as, as the author says, an statistic. That is a summary of the microstates of the observations. And over here, there are some of the points of why we are working now with summaries instead of all of the data. And let's see three main points. A uh, yeah, uh, joint PDF with too high dimensionality can be troublesome to work with. Also, the sample average will serve as a macro description of all of the data, especially if, they, if you have a ton of data. Uh, and as he mentions, if you, you know the behavior of the sample average, you can draw conclusions or inferences about most of the data as well. Now, over here, the author makes a distinction. Uh, later on, it becomes more important when we discuss this idea of confidence intervals. And the distinction is between a probabilistic guarantee and what he calls worst case guarantee. Uh, well, he mentions uh, a pretty popular problem, the birthday paradox. So I will skip over that. And mainly the, the main ideas about why differentiate between worst case scenario and average case uh, are these three points, sorry, these two points. In the case of worst case, sorry, in the situation of worst case guarantee, uh, we, do, we do an exhaustive search. That is, that is as if we are working with Absolutely, absolutely all of the data. Um, because you have all of the data, there is really no uncertainty. So that would be a de deterministic um, conclusion that you can gather from it. But uh, as I mentioned, sometimes too many dimensions can be kind of tricky. So what he mentions, sorry, what he describes as an average case guarantee, it, now the idea is that you, will, you want to obtain some high probability uh, so that some undesirable event does not occur. Now we are not working with all of the data. Uh, for example, we can work with 99.99% of the data. Um, in that case, we will simply be providing a probabilistic currency because we are, we are losing some information. Uh, well, over here, we will, we will be uh, working with the concepts related to this picture later on. So now the main idea for this chapter is to discuss 
two set of mathematical tools, um, two main results, uh, statistic results. The first is about moment generating functions. Uh, they are related to the idea of convolution that we have worked with before. Um, they arise commonly when you want to, to find the PDF of the sum of two random variables, which happen to be independent. The other important, important mathematical concept for this chapter are probability inequalities. Uh, this will be very useful so that we can draw some uh, probabilistic guarantees instead of, in, instead of deterministic ones. Um, and then from such uh, concepts, both probabilistic um, and then this idea of moment generating functions, uh, the author makes actually like, I think he uh, proves, like he demonstrates most of the theorems that come later on over here. Uh, and that is the law of large numbers uh, and the central limit theorem. He, he doesn't get to, to the full proof of the central limit theorem. I think he mentions that there is some math idea that we can cover in this book. Apparently it's too advanced. Uh, but he, the proof he mentions is really not the proof. Okay, so now we move to section one. This will be about moment generating and characteristic functions. Uh, as I mentioned before, they arise when you are working with two random variables. Yeah, of course, each of them has has a, each its own PDF. Uh, and now that you consider the sum of both random variables. We want to know what is the new PDF of that run, of that new random variable. In the case uh, that x and y, uh, if they happen to be independent, then we can describe the PDF of the sum quite easily. It's and it's related to the convolution. Um, uh, well, that's the motivation. And now about the definition about sorry uh, of a moment generating function. That is, you take some random variable x and we find its moment generating function as the expectancy of this transformation, <laughs> this transformation of the random variable. You simply exponentiate it and then you, you multiply it by a complex number s. Now, for the discrete case, the MGF, the, that is the moment generating function of a random variable, of a, a discrete random variable, and then this would be its shape. Of course, it's a, it's simply an expectancy, so it's a formula that we are accustomed to. And um, similarly for the continuous case, uh, now simply it's an integral. La, now the, the interesting part mostly comes for the continuous case, and that's due to the fact that this expression over here is actually quite similar to what is called the Laplace transform. For example, the Laplace transform of some continuous operation, sorry, of some continuous function f uh, is defined as this expression. And we can see then that the MGF of some random variable is precisely the Laplace transform of the PDF of such random variable. Uh, now, this idea of Laplace transform uh, will be useful then when we want to deal with this convolution concept about summing random variables. Uh, some of the properties, well, basic properties of the MGF, uh, well, basically this, if you evaluate it at zero, you get one. Here's a proof. Uh, and an interesting property is that if you take the K derivative of such function and then you evaluate it at zero, and you're actually getting the moments of the random variable. And, well, the proofs are pretty basic. So, and simply we can see some of the examples for some common distributions that we have already covered. Let's see for the Bernoulli with parameter P, then it's MGF is as follows. Uh, for the Poisson with parameter lambda, here it is MGF. And they aren't really quite horrible. So it seems to be a, a nice transformation. Uh, I, I know this is the important part. Uh, why are we bothering to define this MGF operation? So there is a nice property 
for the sum of independent random variables, um, that is as follows over here. You consider n independent random variables, you define the sum of them, uh, C. Uh, it turns out that the MGF of the sum is precisely the product of the MGF of each of those random variables that you have summed. Um, of course, now if you consider the same random, well, random variables with the same uh, distribution, but still independent, then the MGF of their sum is like the, ori the original MGF, but simply exponentiated by how many random variables you are considering in that sum. Well, over here is the proof, it's quite simple. Um, you can see a couple of examples. Uh, I think this proof is quite hacky. I don't know if it's completely true because basically uh, he mentions a couple of examples. Uh, he says the sum of Bernoulli, uh, let's focus on this first one. The, the sum of Bernoulli, of random variables with Bernoulli. Uh, sorry, let me say it again. Let me say it again. The sum of independent random variables with Bernoulli distribution with the same parameter P, and that happens to be a binomial distribution. Uh, and the parameters are how many of those random variables you have sum, um, and now the same parameter P. But how does he get to this part that the distribution of this random variable set, sorry, C, uh, is a binomial? He basically compares what is the MGF of C. Um, if it matches the one that we have for a binomial, so like we saw over here, he says, uh, then it has to be from a binomial. But I, I am not sure if this MGF transformation is sort of like a, a bijection between functions. I suppose it is because it's behaving like a like a Laplace transform, and I think that Laplace transform do are a, a sort of bijection. I am not sure. Yeah, I mean, even the characteristic function, which is a restrictive, you know, just restricted to the complex line, is a is a bijection. So, in fact, it's oh. a better bijection because it has more things that have characteristic functions that have MGFs. Oh, nice. Okay, so I didn't know that. So, so then, yes, the proof are completely valid then. Uh, then another example now for that. Uh, another way to say that is that a probably, a probably distribution that has an MGF is fully described by the MGF, right? There's yes. another way to say that. Yeah, because in, in previous examples, these transformations that we did with, sorry, to, to random variables, they, they usually weren't by equities. Uh, they were reactive up to some uh, relative, no, how do you say it in English? Uh, equivalence relationship. Uh, but now it, it, they do happen to be like precisely a rejection. So that's nice. So another example is you sum n independent random variables. Each of them have a binomial distribution with parameters little n and p. And now the sum of those random variables is also a binomial, but the only parameter that changes is this one, the first one. It gets multiplied. Kind of similar for Poisson, uh, but for Gaussian, it's even more interesting. Now we consider n random variables, each of uh, independent, and each of them have a um, Gaussian distribution, but now we, uh, we let them have Sorry, we let them possibly have different mean and different variants. And even, even in that case, uh, the sum of those distributions happens to be, happens to be Gaussian. Uh, well, well, and this is how the parameters change. They basically simply get some. And we actually proved that already different way last chapter. Huh, I don't know. Didn't we? Wait, when I think of a different book. Um, yeah, multiple multiple um, Gaussians was a big big part of that chapter. Mm 
Did you find the page? Uh, I'm looking. It's hard to find things in this book because they don't have the book, the little thingies. What do you call them? Bookmarks, table contents, bookmarks. Yeah, it's. Uh, I'm getting close to it anyway. Who's hmm. that dog? You know what? No, I take it back. What we did learn is that the sum of two random variables has the sum of the variances and the sum of the uh, means, but not necessarily that they're the sum of two Gaussians is uh, two Gaussians, so or sum of n Gaussians. So I take that back. Oh yeah, here I did find it. So it's on page um, two eighty three. So it's just the sum of two Gaussians in that case, where they use the convolution on page two eighty three. So they showed it a different way by directly doing the convolution rather than doing the um, using the generating functions as, in this case. Yeah, so that's doing the convolution. I guess you could generalize it in, the, you know, by just it's continually adding. It's already generalized because yeah. in that, the end case is simply doing two by two. Yeah, two by two over and over again. Okay, so following with the book. How'd you get all the way back to that page so quickly? <laughs> uh, I, I opened in the different app. Ah, that's smart. <laughs> I didn't really get why do we need to to restrict our uh, sorry the domain of the NGF, but he says that at least for some PDF, uh, they don't have to be sorry they aren't defined in the entire right half of the plane of the complex plane. Uh, I I wish he would have shown some example of that. Didn't they? The Cauchy distribution is the key example. Uh, yeah, but then he compares that using the unbounded. Yeah. So the yeah, Cauchy, not the domain thingy. I don't. You know what? I didn't. I just kind of my eyes kind of glazed over. said about not defining the entire right hand plane. That's going to come out of nowhere. But the fact of the matter is yeah. that the moments don't the moments don't exist for the Cauchy distribution. So you can't obviously use a moment generating function, but you can it still has a characteristic function. It's just a Fourier transform of the distribution. Okay. And the characteristic function is. Um, Still very interesting. I, I think we've been gathering quite a quite a lot of feedback for the book. We we still have been like uh, I know saving the notes, maybe to send it to the author or something. True. <laughs> mm, okay, so now for the characteristic function, it's really simply um, MGF restricted to the axis, sorry, to the imaginary axis. Um, then he proposes a, another, another definition for the characteristic function so that the formulas uh, match up quite nicely to the Fourier transform. I think he does that because the Fourier transform uh, comes up uh, with the convolution, maybe not so directly with the Laplace transform, but I'm not so sure of that. What do you mean? I misunderstood that. Uh, why, why does he change the definition of that? Oh, just so it matches the definition of the forward transform. You didn't want to match the inverse transform. I think it's a minor point, but especially since he doesn't really use that very much after this. So why bother with that? Yeah, sure <laughs> yeah. Uh, he I says everybody it, else defines it this way. I wouldn't define it this other way just because it matches up with the way the Fourier transform is defined. And then that's it never okay. comes up. Why? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, here's the point that you mentioned, uh, uh, restricting the domain of the NGF so that the moments actually do exist. And then some prob probability inequalities. Uh, I think actually they are 
not simply probability, at least some of them uh, are really measure inequalities. Uh, well, this this first one is trivial, right? The upper bound for the for the measure of a union of measurable sets. Yeah. Uh, another one. I just well, verify this. I, sorry, I just want to interrupt. I just verified that this is the only chapter where he uses the characteristic function. So he could have just left it with these normal definitions, uh, not cut out bigger role. <laughs> I know maybe he's playing planning to update the book ah, and maybe. actually comes through with these like little remarks that they, they never come up afterwards. So uh, well, this inequality uh, you actually described in the in the previous chapter, it's mainly due to uh, the expectancy behaving of almost like an inner product. Then we, we have the Jensen inequality, is this one over here, and it works for any convex function. And the convex is, uh, well, they look like this. Uh, between two points in the graph, uh, the actual graph is behind this, this red line that connects the points that you have selected. Uh, well, I only know that this function happens to be quite useful in optimization and such. Um, I didn't really have seen them, in, at least when I took measure theory as a course, but I don't know, maybe they are useful over here as well. And then Markov's inequality, uh, this is an upper bound for the tail of the, of a random variable. And then, let's see, Terry Chep's inequality, a generalization of Markov's one. And now uh, we're, we're considering a, like a probability that the, oh, um, I don't want to say confidence interval, even though it's it kind of has the, the look of it because we, we still haven't defined it. Uh, but it, it's going to behave like a confidence interval because we are looking at uh, where the, how much is the, the random variable uh, far, far away from the expected mean, well, from the mean. And, and here's the program. And then there is one more, I think. And uh, two more. Chernoff's bound. Uh, well, he says that it's going to be useful for more inequalities. I think he only uses it twice. And it is this bound now with a more ugly formula. And then, uh, well, then he, he proposes an example of these inequalities that we have seen. Uh, how can we actually use them? Uh, he consider he considers some random variable x with this, with this distribution. Uh, we can we can prove this simply using the inequalities in the, were shown before. Uh, uh, we have a lemma from such a segment. Now an upper bound for for the tail of a Gaussian distribution. Um, this will be useful later on uh, when we see the central limit theorem. And then another theorem for another upper bound for the tail of a Gaussian distribution. I think he compares here over here uh, because we've, we've seen so many upper bounds for the tail for the tail of a, of a random variable. Uh, we may be curious as to if 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 some of them. Sorry, if one of them is better than the other, or if it depends in the context, uh, it does depend. For example, the Chernoff uh, inequality, uh, it's a better upper bound if you consider a greater number of observations. Well, in this case, it would be a, more, a greater number of random variables. And over here, he's simply comparing the upper bounds for a particular case of an exact random variable already defined. It is this one over here. This Gaussian one, and this two, this uh, Chernoff one, at least in this case, happens to be quite a good fit. Uh, and then the last inequality that he mentions uh, is this one over here. 
I think this one here is a seed to prove the law of large numbers, something like that. But basically, all of these inequalities will be useful to prove the, the following two important theorems, and where are probably some of the most important basic theorems in statistics. Um, I know, I don't, I don't want to mention this. Okay, over here, this part is interesting. For example, when we were, when we were considering a whole thing's inequality, which, which had this form, we can actually rearrange the terms in, in this expression. Uh, and the natural, uh, the, the natural result that we obtain, uh, takes in the form of the expected, sorry, of the confidence interval. So it's over here. So, uh, like a uh, such tool that it's used so many times in statistics actually has a good theoretical basis thanks to this inequality over here. And he mentions this confidence interval. Uh, it says with the probability at least one minus delta, delta being this upper bound that we have. Probability at least one minus delta uh, that the interval over here, this confidence interval, includes the two population mean. Um, well, I want to mention this. Uh, we already know. Um, uh, this part I found interesting. I haven't, I am in the introduction to statistical learning booklet, but I hadn't still uh, seen this used, this confidence inequality. Confidence inequality. Also, I, I don't remember that coming up in the in that book club. To the truth, uh, <laughs> I did that one recently, but yeah, it's a good book. I like it. Okay, so he mentions that it's not really it's not just an upper bound for probabilities, but also an asymptotic description of training error, testing error, um, the number of observ yeah, and the number of observations that you consider. In your training sample, probably uh, so that you don't overfit too much, I guess. Um, and it's useful as a way to compare the theoretical performance of one model versus another one. Okay, so now in the two next sections, uh, it's like the result of what we have just seen: this moment generating function, characteristic function, and these inequalities. All, all of these mathematical tools now. Uh, getting actually used to to prove or partially prove some very strong statistical theorems. Uh, we already have already described why we need to so no why it's useful to work with the sample average. So we will be working a lot with this scenario. These are independent, identically distributed random variables. And as we as I said before the definition of the sample average of this sequence of random variables, it's simply like a simple mean. But of course, this mean is also a random variable. So we can we can calculate like expectancy for it or variance as well. Over here, for example, he mentions that if these random variables are IID, that is independent and identically distributed, then the expectation of this sample average is the same as the initial uh, expectancy. So this is an important point. It's, it's similar to, to the points mentioned in the beginning of the chapter, but he, he says that uh, because we, we never have access to the population statistic, Sometimes you do if the population is quite small, but of course, most of the time it's not. So you won't have access to such information. Then the sample average is an estimate of such value of such number. Um, because it's only an estimate, we need to know how good of a estimate is it is. So the way we, we are going to, to perform that, uh, that measure, that measure of uncertainty, uh, is with the variance 
So now we calculate what is the variance of such sample average. And again, in this scenario of IID, uh, it's the same variance as the initial random variables, but it gets it scaled down via yeah, the number of random variables that we are considering. And the interpretation is that the more samples we use to construct the sample average, then the less deviation the random variable will have. So its variance tends to zero. Um, and this part is interesting. It, it reminded me of the Mobius function, but maybe I'm looking to too much where something that it's not over there. It, re it reminded you of what? The that. Mobius function. Oh. <laughs> So we consider the case of Bernoulli random variables, specifically n of them, and they all have the same parameter p equals to one half. And of course, we are considering independent. Uh, so now we, we know for the Bernoulli, this would be the expectancy and this would be the variance. So what it is the expectancy of the sample average? So we calculate it, it's the same parameter p. And now the variance of the sample average, of course, is the variance of the initial one, but it's scaled down. Uh, but now, if we consider the actual experiment, that is, we change n, we change how many Bernoulli random variables we are considering. Uh, and we do the, the simulation for the Bernoulli random variables. For each of those simulations, uh, we get uh, some sample average. So if you plot those uh, with respect to the number of the, the number of random variables, we get this kind of shape, which seems to be like bounded between these two red, well, they are not lines, between these two red curves. And as he mentioned, we observe that as n grows, as we consider more and more random variables that are IID, then the variance shrinks to zero, and therefore the sample average is converging to some value, and that is the true population mean, as we can, as we can see over here in the graphic. Uh, well, he, he mentioned something about outliers, but I think that they don't come up afterwards. So. So the part is interesting. Uh, now we are going to consider Quite, quite a, uh, I think three different ways of working with convergence in a probabilistic setting. Uh, first, we'll be working with something called probabilistic convergence. And that is okay for this theorem, this weak law of large numbers. The actual theorem <coughs> is as follows. Again, we consider n random variables that are IID. They have mean, mu, and variance sigma squared, but we want the second moment to be bounded. Uh, and then in that case, we get that uh, the sample average uh, satisfies this condition. You pick any, eps any positive epsilon, then the limit of this probability, as you consider more and more random variables of this type, uh, this probability tends to zero. Again, the inequalities that we saw are quite useful to, to prove this. It's simply via upper bounding this probability via something that vanishes a sentence to infinity. And an interpretation of what is going on in this scenario over here, in this theorem, is this or this, this. That is, the weak law of large numbers states that as the number of random variables considered increases, then the variance of the sample average tends to zero, it shrinks. Um, um, I think there was a better interpretation. Uh, maybe it comes next to, uh, later on. Okay, so... So maybe to get a, a, a clear description of what is a probability convergence. So what is actually converging? Well, what is converging are these probabilities. 
it's not like some distribution is converging to another one. It's simply the values of the probabilities over here. Why are they tending to, as you consider, more and more random variable? Uh, and again, he mentions that this, this theorem is labeled as weak because having a small probability, like very, very close to zero, but not zero, uh, it does not exclude the possibility of something happening. Uh, even having a zero probability doesn't exclude the probability of something happening. But I think that comes up uh, uh, like in scenarios where you have some measure zero sets, like something like throwing a, throwing a dart in, in the real line and expecting the, the dart to, to land in a rational number. I mean, the probability is zero, but it can happen. Uh, and then, uh, well, he simply describes a little bit more in detail what is this convergence in probability, that is how these probabilities are tending to some value. Uh, in, in our case, in ten, they tended to zero. But let's see. Okay, this is important part. Uh, no, no this consideration, but really this one over here. Having a probability converging to zero, as, a, as it is happening over here, an important conclusion that we can gather from it is that it means that for any tolerance level, uh, we can always find some large enough n, some enough number of random variables, so that the probability is uh, smaller than the tolerance. So like we can control the margin of error for these probabilities. Um, now I need simply a definition for converging probability. Well, he mentioned some interesting example, but there's really not much time. And I, I want to end the chapter. So I won't cover it. Uh, he mentions, can we prove the weak law of large numbers using this particular inequality that we see? Sorry, that we saw. Um, he does prove it in, I think, in two different scenarios, but not the general one, so I won't do this. And now this is important. Uh, is the weak law of large numbers always true? Well, of course not, because in the theorem, we ask for the second moment to exist. So it, it has to be important. And as you mentioned as well, for the case of the Cauchy distribution, where the second moment well, it explodes, then in, in that scenario, yes, the, the weak law of large numbers doesn't hold. Now, because there is a weak one, there is a strong one. Um, there is this theorem about the strong law of large numbers. It happens to be a case that any sequence satisfying the strong law will also satisfy the weak one but not vice versa. And so what is a strong law of large numbers? We again consider n random variables, independent and identically distributed with mean, mu, and variance uh, sigma squared. But now we want the fourth moment to be bounded. Then in this case, we get this another kind of limit. Now the difference is we're considering the limit of what? In the previous law, we consider the limit of probabilities. So, but now over here, we're considering um, this. The strong law answers the question, what is the limiting object of the sample average as n grows? What is this random variable converging to? And, so we are not really working with numbers in such case. It's not the limit of some number, but actually this expression, this limit of the sample average, if you consider more and more random variables, such expression on itself is also a random variable. So you, you can consider the case, what's the probability that such random variable equals some value? And of course, uh, such qu such question is something that we have already considered. Uh, for example, in the in the PMF, for the of course the discrete case, uh, in the for the 
this for the density function, it really didn't quite make sense because it was a probability zero, but for the discrete one, it did. So, ah, uh, yes, I didn't understand this. I, I hope you did. He says, the strong law says that this limiting object, this one over here, will successfully become a deterministic number mu after a finite number of failures. Uh, when, when he said that, I, I thought, uh, he says the probability of some event equals one. Uh, so the probability of the complement, no, sorry, there has to be some uh, measure zero set where the bad stuff is happening. But then he says, no, over here, that you aren't really considering a pressure, sorry, measure zero sets, but that absolutely always, except for a finite number of cases, no, not a measure set case, a, it will happen that this limiting object has a probability one, to match this population mean. Did you get this part about finite number of failures? I, I wasn't convinced of that. <laughs> I did a little, like looked around on the internet and I couldn't really find that backed up anywhere. Uh, I was gonna look in, I know he quotes a lot of uh, the, the different book I probably have on my shelf over there. I should look at that, but here's let me grab it real quick. Hello. Because, yeah, I agree with you. That seems a little bit like, that doesn't seem like that could be right. <laughs> you know what I mean? It seems like it can't be right. Maybe it is right, but after a finite number of times, I'm not buying it. Let's see, page 280. Yeah. I am tempted to 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 not believe in the author because at least when, when I saw measure theory as a course, it, a lot of times you had like uh, there is probability, sorry, there is measure. No, there is only scenario where it everything works fine except for um, a measure zero set. Yeah. But now he says that it's not really a measure zero, but actually some finite number of cases. So, well, again, it's measure zero, but it's too specific. Like, I do believe that it can be an infinite amount, but it's still measure zero. Yeah. I don't know. This this book that he I don't know if I have a camera yeah. I don't here he quotes a lot from this book and uh, in in this particular chapter Bertsekis and Sitskilis whatever two Greek names I can't pronounce um, and in his discussion he just he says that um, the strong law large numbers implies that for any epsilon greater than zero, the probability of the difference that will exceed epsilon an infinite number of times is zero. So for any large n. So it's only gonna be a finite number of times, like you said. So I guess it would be some n. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not quite buying that. I guess I can't really internalize that right now, but I'll look at it well, afterwards. So in such definition of the strong law, if he's using epsilon, no, he's not. So, that's, it's, but in the text, he does use it, which is kind of weird. Mm -hmm. Not in the, in, the, in the definition, he doesn't use it. So I don't know. That's why I need to look at some more. See so how did epsilon get back in there? Well, if it is epsilon, then uh, I I am I am tended to believe that yes, there is a finite case because it's like when you're considering a simple convergence. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. For some epsilon, I got you. Yeah, for some epsilon. Maybe that's what's missing from this discussion here. Yes. She doesn't bring epsilon back in. Um, Okay. 
uh, over here and he says the strong law well it's not deterministic well because we don't really ever approach this limiting object right. in real life um and also the strong law does not handle uh, cases of measure zero subsets right. so i don't know everything is weird but at least we can now work with another type of probabilistic convergence and that is the almost sure convergence then there is still a little bit of time so and uh, this is the same almost sure convergence is the type that we're looking at right now for the strong law and this is one over here probability at some limiting object some limiting random variable uh, equals some some deterministic number and simply we label it as such. Uh, well, this, this example was interesting, but now there's really not much time. Uh, here's a partial proof, I think. Uh, I, I don't know, maybe it's full proof. Okay, this is interesting part of this, at least for me, because I found that I, ha I had a couple of misconceptions about this theorem. So let's see, the central limit theorem. Uh, well, now it's when it comes a little more into play, uh, the whole discussion about convolutions, because up to now we're simply been using the inequalities of price. Um, so what we will be working with is, in in some sense, in some informal sense, uh, is, is, it like, is there like a kind of distribution as a limiting object? Uh, as we see in, in this example that you consider the sum of IID random variables, and as you do the histogram of the of the values obtained, they, it seems to match a, a, a Gaussian curve. So is it correct to say that there is a convergence to a Gaussian distribution? Uh, and, and then we find later on that, no, it's nearly not a convergence in the sense of random variables, like considering a metric in some space of random variables, but it's another type of approximation. It's really the, probably the most basic kind of convergence for function than that is a point wise function. So I wonder what is the uh, uniform convergence uh, case, sorry, analog case for the central limit theorem, because there must be, because if central limit theorem is really just point wise convergence, uh, then what is a uniform convergence case in statistics? I don't know. I don't know either, yeah. I haven't thought about uniform convergence for a while. <laughs> okay, so this is the interesting part. It says central limit theorem. Uh, we consider X sub N as a sample average and we are going to normalize it, and we represent such normalization as uh, zeta sub n. So the central limit, central limit theorem asserts that the CDF of this normalized variable converges pointwise to the CDF of uh, a Gaussian with parameters 0 and 1. And, and over here, the important parts were this pointwise convergence, and the fact that such convergence is being applied to the CDF, now to the PDF. Uh, and those were, at least in my case, my, my two mistakes. I, I thought that the central limit theorem applied some type of like functional analysis convergence, so probably something like uniform convergence, um, and that the PDFs were converging as actual random variables, not, not like numbers simply. So he says, we're only saying that the values of the CDF, those numbers are converging point-wise. Mm -hmm. uh, and such idea of this point-wise convergence uh, is defined as convergence in distribution. You have some sequence of random variables. Anyway, what? Uh, this is for future, yeah, I found, I just Googled that. Check it out later. A quick glance yeah. didn't really give me any quick information. But <laughs> Interesting. And I, I was a little bit um, 
lost over here in this definition because he's considering a sequence, but he only mentions a finite number of random variables. Okay, so he actually means he probably means a countable amount of random variables. Uh, well, under CDFs, and then you consider the point-wise convergence of such CDFs, and uh, how uh, uh, how does it compare to the values of this other random variable? So in this case, if we have if this expression holds, we would say that these random variables are converging in distribution. To this one over here. This is theta random variable. Uh, over here is interesting because we saw before if you consider I, I, D, Bernoulli random variables and then you consider a random variable that is the sum of them, then at least I saw that when you plot the histogram, what you're looking at is a, a Gaussian. If you are considering a lot of random variables, but, but no, I was saying the formula, the distribution of the sum is precisely a binomial. It simply looks like a Gaussian because, uh, well, because it looks like really the approximation that we're going to do is the values of probabilities, not in the actual shape of the core, not in the actual distribution. So over here, he, well, over here he mentions that, that the convergence and distribution conserves a conversion of the values of the CDF uh, and not the PDF. Uh, then he says that we're working with the CDF instead of the PDF. Well, really uh, due to the same reasons that we did in previous chapters, uh, because we have continuity, uh, it's always defined in all of the real line when you work with the CDF. So it, it behaves much more nicely than the PDF. Uh, and this important part, he says, one may be tempted to say that this random variable, sorry, this sequences, sorry, this sequence of random variables, theta sub n, is converging, is converging to another random variable. Uh, and also that perhaps the PDF of, sorry, the sequence of the PDF of this theta sub n random variables is converging to the PDF of this another random variable, uh, but no, do, 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 both of those assertions are wrong. Really, it's just point-wise. Numbers are converging, no, not functions. But here it says that in spite of the limitation of working with the CDA for the central limit theorem, uh, if you consider continuous random variables, then there is also a kind of point-wise convergence for the PDF as well, not just the CDF. Um, I already mentioned this. Um, over here, this interpreting the converging distribution, that is what we are looking at with the central limit theorem, and he says, when we write this expression, this converging distribution, we mean that these values are, conver are converging to this value. Uh, and such convergence happens for any zeta, any zip that uh, is a, any zip where this function happens to be continuous. Uh, again, it's not a convergence from one random variable to another. It's just numbers tending to numbers. Uh, well, uh, well, this is conver convergence distribution is actually weaker than convergence in probability in, in the sense that this does not necessarily imply the other one. Um, let's see, another, po another point for the central limit theorem. Well, we already saw the definition, so it's mainly this part over here, like another interpretation of it. He says, and the central limit theorem thing asserts that the sample average 
which is also a random variable, has a CDF that is converging point-wise to a CDF of a Gaussian random variable. Uh, and this convergence is useful in the sense, not that the graphs look similar, these histograms that we saw in a previous, in a previous image, but that you can estimate probabilities associated with a sample average, uh, now simply approximating the, uh, the probability with respect to a Gaussian, so the CDF of a Gaussian random variable. Uh, and that's really the key fact. Uh, this, this, theorem, this theorem allows you to estimate probabilities when you are considering sample average of, in, of enough random variables. I think it usually have to be at least 30 observations, something like that, uh, for real life, good enough approximations. Uh, it's really more of the same. Uh, here is the important part also. Now you can estimate this probability of the sample average, estimated via the CDF of the of the standard Gaussian. Um, I think that's it. Uh, now, simply more examples. Uh, well, the limitation is really also what you mentioned. Uh, the fourth moment had to exist. So again, it doesn't call for Cauchy. I know the third moment, sorry. But still, I think it doesn't convert it also for Cauchy. So maybe finish on only with this part. When will the central limit theorem fail? When you're considering quite a few amount of random variables in your sample average. Uh, if the third moment of your random variables is too large, I wish so it, it doesn't hold for the Cauchy random variable. Uh, uh, and I didn't mention this, it's important also that the central limit theory theorem, yes, it provides you um, approximations of, of probabilities, uh, but such approximations, it works mostly for points near the population mean. So it's, it's, it's really not such a suitable approximation in the tail parts of the distribution of the sample average. Uh, and yeah, that's it. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Very good. Yeah, I think that um, that was a useful chapter to learn. Um, a little more detail. I mean, I think I've seen most of these things before. I have not seen the turnoff bound, and I think that's something I want to look at some more because it looks extremely useful, like you said, for looking at estimating out on the tails when you don't have any information other than it's a sum of random variables. And the Gaussian approximation is actually pretty bad there. So I need to look into that some more. That's something I had not seen before the turnoff. I knew Shebyshev, I knew about Markov, I knew about central limit, strong weak law, but I didn't know anything about that. Uh, turn off bound and that other bound, which I already forgot the name of. <laughs> hop, biff, hop, ding, something like that. So, very interesting. And did the link you sent was about the uh, uniform convergence case of the central limit theory, or? I just looked up uniform convergence and probability, and this is what it came up with. I'm not sure what it actually says. That's what I was going to look at later and see what it says when I get some rest. <laughs> Got this head cold, cold. It's slowing me down today. But yeah, this is good. I was going to say this is a, this is a good approach that you used here. Using the PDF with the highlighting, that works really well. So we're gonna, I, I like that stuff. I'm going to copy that myself. Yeah. I think only I'll do that for this booklet because the book is very dense. Yeah. Like very, very. No, I meant just, yeah, for this book club. So it's just the two of us. If there's more people, it's a little more useful, I think, to make more saving notes and everything. But book down or Porto or whatever. It's always good practice. 
and also we've been kind of bashing the author so i don't know if, <laughs> if people will want to do another cohort maybe they don't like this book i like the book it just there's a tour it's like i think as it gets later in the book it seems like there could have been more um peer review maybe that's all okay well uh, I, I don't have anything more to add, so I think I'll see you in a week. Are you going to do any of the exercises for this chapter? Uh, yes. Uh, well, I haven't looked at them. Okay. Well, post on Slack if you, if you decide on something you want to look at, and I'll may look out too. And you can see what I did with the previous chapter ones as well. I posted those. Yes. I did some anyway. Okay. All right. Bye. All right, bye. Thanks, Lucy. I appreciate it.